Welcome to Indie Talks, part 17, part of the 17th annual Indie Memphis Film Festival. This is Where's the Money? How do I get it? Conversations are once again free and open to the public thanks to the support of the Hollenberg Foundation. Thanks to Fuel Film for leading the panels. None of this would be possible without the generous support of Duncan Williams. Please put your phone on vibrate. A lot of times people tell you turn it off, we want you to leave it on because we want you to tweet, Facebook, and tell your friends about this panel, this event, using the hashtag IndieMemphis. So uh, please share this good information. Um, our guest of our panelists today is Mike Ryan. He is a New York City-based independent filmmaker, independent producer, uh, who is known for works such as Forty Shades of Blue, Losers Take All, Free Indeed, and Jumbo. And I'll ask him to tell you more about it himself. Mike, take it away. Thanks. Hey guys, thanks for coming out. Um, so uh, I'm just going to try to uh, talk about some trends that we're seeing in the indie space. It's also important, I think, to uh, remember that when I talk about independent film, specifically it's geared towards my taste and the films I've made um, are, you know, they're kind of art films. They're very uh, ser serious films in the sense that uh, they're dramas and they're often about real situations in the world. Um, so I'm not, uh, let's say, purely in, in this business for entertaining. Um, although that's part of it, but it's not the main goal. So I'm biased a little bit towards uh, the types of films I make. Um, first, just quickly, I just talk about the different aspects of finance, just so that we can get some terms out of the way, different aspects of finance plans. Um, so there's private equity. Private equity is the cash. Uh, uh, and then a finance plan will also include sometimes pre-sales. So that would be like a foreign sale or sometimes foreign sales advance that um, we see, uh, let's say you have an actor like Julia Stiles, you can get a foreign sales agent and then at, at a festival before you make the film, let's say at Berlin, they will go around to distributors in different countries like let's say there's a distributor in Germany and they show them the script and they say I've got Tom Cruise and it's Thunderball Five, <laughs> and it's Tom Cruise and and uh, Julia Stiles, and they both have tight pants and big guns, and <laughs> and the German guy says, "Wow, that sounds great. I will pre-buy that for Germany for a million dollars." And on indie films, we don't see it as much as we used to. We used to really finance films in part through pre-sales, but it still occasionally happens. And then there's a tax credit in various states. And generally speaking, there's really only about three states where the tax credit is reliable enough to put that into your finance plan. And um, that is uh, Georgia, Louisiana, and New York are really the only states that have a, a consistent year-to-year -year reliable tax credit program. You don't really want to put, let's say, Tennessee uh, tax incentive really into your finance plan because you may not get it, as in the case of Losers Take All when the state denied me what they said I deserved, uh, and some other Memphis filmmakers who were denied. Uh, and then, or it may go bankrupt, like in Michigan. So uh, they pulled the Michigan uh, credit for a while. Now it's back at a reduced amount. Uh, in New Jersey, a new governor came in. Suddenly, there was no longer a tax credit. Connecticut, suddenly there was no longer a tax credit after it had been for several years. People who were planning to make the film put the 30% tax credit into their finance plan, and then suddenly, when they're about to go, there's no tax credit. So you don't really want to put a tax, a state tax credit into your finance plan, but generally it's between 15 to 30% of in-state spend, the state will give it back to you. But it's a problem because they usually take a year to give it back to you, so there's cash flow issues. And then there's uh, in-kind value that's part of a, that can be part of a finance plan. For example, the film that uh, I shot here in Memphis called Free Indeed, 
Uh, we had Airy Alexa camera and all the lenses. And the Airy Alexa camera package was about $25,000 to $30,000 in value. And what I did was I went to the camera rental house in New York City, showed them the script, and I had David Harewood from Homeland and Edwina Finley from The Wire and Treme. And I said, can you give me the camera for $5,000 in cash, and then I'll give you points on the back end as an equity person also, as an equity position. So he gave us, for, I gave him $5,000, and he gave us a $25,000 camera. And then I included him as the equivalent of $15,000 in the finance plan. So it was an in-kind service. And then there's the other component is debt equity. And debt equity is sometimes an investor who looks at your tax credit and he looks at your pre-sales advances or estimates and says, I will lend you a um, million dollars or 30% of your budget. That means that he gets paid first in front of the investors. So he's a debt participant. And a lot of investors don't like that because they want to be paid first, but sometimes it's the only component necessary to put the plan together. So those are just some terms. The next thing that's important to understand uh, when you're thinking about finance is to know the difference between before 2008 and after 2008, the fall of 2008 versus the winter of 2009. We're living in the nuclear winter of 2009, although it's getting a little better. But basically, before 2008, the way we would finance independent films how we would get investors interested is that we would look at the list of Sundance films that were sold. So basically, you know, what we do is we make the film on speculation. It's a speculative process. There's no distributor when we make the film. Then we take it to a festival and we hope a distributor will pay for the rights to lease the film, to distribute the film, for a dollar amount that's more than what we put into it. That's the whole concept. You go to an investor and say, give me $1 million because I believe a distributor will acquire it for $2 million or maybe a $1 million, and then we'll participate in the profits in the theater. But like the music business, as we know, we rarely see and participate in the actual ticket-taking money. That's not, we don't see that as filmmakers. So really the hope is that there is a <coughs> distributor who is very confident that he's going to return his money by taking the film for a 15-year lease and he will exploit it, not us as the filmmaker. That's the, that's the dream. And then often what happens is we don't get a distributor and then we have to self-distribute. But so prior to 2008, the basic way that it functioned would be you would look at all the films that played at Sundance uh, the independent uh, filmmaker magazine would run a grid that would say Happy Texas was made for four million and it sold for fifteen million. And uh, Blair, uh, you know, not Blair Witch, but uh, you know, some sort of drama was made for a million and sold for three million. Then you, as a filmmaker, would go to investors or investment companies and say, my film is similar to Happy Texas. Similar because I have the same actor, or it's a similar story, and I have also a, a, an actor that, that's of that same level, or is even better. And they made it for three and sold it for seven, so I'm gonna make it for one and hope I'm gonna sell it for two. And that was the thing that motivated investors prior to 2008, it was completely valid, but uh, what happened was, well, in, in January, Sundance 2008, I was there with a film that I produced called Choke with Sam Rockwell and Angelica Houston based on the book by Chuck Palahniuk by the same name, Choke. And we made it for $3 million and we screened it on a Monday night at 9.30. And we were at our party afterwards and um, one of the producers uh, told me, he said, Peter Rice at Fox loves it. 
we're talking, our salesperson is talking to him now, and within about an hour and a half, he had bought the film on two pieces of paper with his lawyer uh, for $5 million. And so we had made immediately a $2 million profit. And that was in January 2008. In the fall of 2008, I was shooting uh, Life During Wartime in Puerto Rico, and I remember going to work one morning and seeing this newspaper being sold of a, woman, of a picture of a woman holding her head, and the headline was uh, Collapso Economico. Uh, Puerto Rican Spanish, Collapso Economico. And uh, that was, you know, the shattering of our, 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 our faith in um, debt financing and real estate bubble burst. And at the same time, the in, a lot of bubbles burst. But in our industry, the indie film bubble burst. Faith was lost because we had a lot of films, like in 2008, of January, I sold the film for five million to Fox. They did their darndest to try to promote it, but it didn't make any money. The same festival, James Seamus of Focus acquired a film called uh, Hamlet Two, uh, yeah, and it was um, he bought it for twelve million dollars, and it made less than a million dollars in the box office that year. So there was a shakeout. People got fired. Companies had to reduce, and in Sundance of 2009, there were barely anybody there in terms of buying. There was no buying energy. All these films that had been made in finance in 2008 went unsold, and 2009, January 2009, was a really uh, like a, it was uh, like a funeral, Sundance was, when normally it's a real bartering place. And then all of 2009, nobody could get films financed. The only people who made films at a very low budget were people who were in it just for passion. And um, in 2010, Sundance was the best Sundance ever, in my opinion. The only films that were there were films that were made for the right reason, which was for passion. And we had great films like Septian and a lot of strange films played Sundance in 2010. But still, there was very little to none buying energy. And this has continued and started to pick up in 2011, 2012. It started to come back a little bit. But the bottom line is that for a drama, even with a star, you really aren't seeing an acquisition price more than a million dollars. And um, that's for drama, meaning serious drama, uh, and uh, basically stories that don't involve guns or overt sexuality or overt uh, suspense themes, that's what I mean by drama, um, that's really, with stars, the best number you can get is around a million. And that's the reality. Combined with the fact, I'm gonna be negative for a little while, but there's gonna be a turn. Combined with the fact that the reality is is that the numbers on the film medium say, on the film sales, film ticket going, that it's a medium that is really past its heyday. It was 20th century medium, it's no longer what it was. People uh, have many platforms to watch movies on. Uh, VOD is one, DVD is dead. It's very hard to monetize that viewing uh, uh, patterns. Young people, basically the millennial generation, are incapable of sitting in a chair in a fixed direction for more than 10 minutes without pushing a button that says change the channel. Uh, and so the 90 minute fixed chair format for the millennials doesn't exist. Uh, it, it's just not something for them. They're not interested in it. Um, the reality is in the 20th century, there was very few ways to engage in stories visually. There was film, there was TV, and there was theater. And that was really about it, you know, when you think about it. And now people engage in narrative through war games, uh, uh, Vimeo things, they watch a dog fall or something, uh, uh, or somebody um, pick their nose and, and laugh, and they laugh, and those are minute long. And so the format of the 90 minute is significantly in decline. Overall, film sales are completely in decline. They take the, Hollywood takes the number and says, oh, this many people saw Batman uh, 5, and thus, that number is higher than, in the aggregate for that year, then the number is high. 
But in reality, the tail is completely dropped off. So everybody's going to see Batman 2 or Avengers 5. And that's mostly where the number is. And that's about 85 to 90% of all ticket sales. So the reality is people are seeing less films. So that's the negative thing. And there's less business, there's less money, consequently. There's less money around. There are almost no development companies anymore. Nobody really develops property the way they used to, the way Ted Hope used to at Good Machine and the studios used to. So we had this strange situation <clears throat> where there's really, the metrics of the situation say that investment in film, there's really nothing more absurd. Uh, it's a highest risk situation that's really beyond, you just have to look at the numbers. Yet there's more private equity in our business than ever before. John Sloss said it at South by Southwest at his panel about called The Future of Filmmaking. There's more people investing in our space than ever before. There's more people putting money into film than ever before, but bigger than the heyday. And then you have to ask yourself, <clears throat> why is this? Why are these people putting money into the film when the metrics are quite apparent and quite obvious? Why are they putting money in? And who are these people that are putting money in? And when you start to look at them, and there's some big key players, uh, but, the, but their, their key players actually reflect, I think, a very particular attitude that a lot of investors have now, is that there's this belief, you have to look, why would somebody buy the Boston Globe or the Washington newspaper, a dead medium, a dead newspaper, uh, the newsprint as being a dying industry, and you get Bezos or any of these really big uh, heavy hitters buying newspapers. And what you see is that, you know, from the Piketty book or whatever his name is, you know, he talks about that 70% of all actual capital, meaning money in the United States is owned by 10% of the people. So we see a real condensation. There's more billionaires than ever before. There's more inherited wealth than ever before. There's more money in fewer people's hands. And those people are younger. And those people are actually highly educated. And those people are actually interested in changing the world. So this is not a Carnegie early situation with capital where people just say, I want mine, I want mine, I want mine. You have a people, a person like Tony Shea in Las Vegas who Create, started selling shoes and then sold it to Amazon and it's called Zappos and now he's building an empire, he's been building an empire in Las Vegas. He's somebody that is not interested in just money for the sake of money, nor is he interested in it just to build a big house. These are utopian visionaries who are empowered by their money and they want to help the world. This, I sincerely believe that some people, you know, think that it's, uh, it's, uh, there's other agendas. Um, but then, so that's what I'm saying is that there's an intelligent, very wealthy class out there. Some people would say, oh, they're just ego driven, they're dumb, and they're not looking at the statistics that you know, and they just want to be there for glamour reasons and they're not smart. That's not the people I've met, that's not the people I work with. And so we have a, a situation where the most difficult art films in the popular, the art, filmmakers in this space, I would say probably one of the best filmmakers working in the United States, besides like Michael Mann on a technical level, but in terms of content and skill is Paul Thomas Anderson. And he's, you know, some people would say Terrence Malick to a degree, but I would say Paul Thomas Anderson. And he's consistently financed by a woman who uh, is one of the youngest billionaires from inherited wealth. She's Larry Ellison's daughter um, who created uh, Oracle, I think. And um, she, uh, Megan Ellison, has a company called Anapura. Uh, and she is giving money to films like The Master, to Her, which was the Spike Jones film, because she wants to participate in an intellectual life in America that's somewhere beyond the bandwidth of men in tights and dog videos. And that's the bottom line. That is significantly why people are investing in film, investing in an industry that's in some ways the equivalent of steel in 1982. And the, the belief is that the film medium is a powerful medium to convey ideas 
It's a powerful medium in which to engage new audiences to convey your view of the world. And it's also a place where, in America, it's one of the only few public spaces where we can actually have some sense of an intellectual discussion. Um, in America, I always say, I speak a lot in Europe, I will say in Europe that there's basically three really dirty words in America uh, that they all start with a C that people rarely really want to talk about or mention, but it's cancer, communism, and culture. Um, and culture, not using it in a, using it in a real way in the sense that it's about the intellectual life of the mind, not as a colloquial term, sports culture. Uh, this is the film medium is how we can talk about things in a cultural way here in America. Um, and people who want to have their money go to good purpose find the film medium as a space in which they can engage the world. And this is consistent. We have a fund <clears throat> based in California called Game Changer. Game Changer came about through a group of very wealthy business women who were upset with the fact that there were not many female directors, female writers, female directors. They hired Minette Louie, a, a producer like myself, to head this fund. And uh, the first film they financed was called Land Ho. Uh, which was about two older men on the road. It was written and directed by a woman, uh, co-directed by a woman, written by a woman. And they are funding and actively looking for female-driven stories that are particularly somehow reflecting about what it means to be alive in the world. These are independent, very smart, wealthy women who work in the business, of stocks and some of them are in some of them are doctors they're able to analyze statistics they're able to look at these basic statistics and say hmm on a metric level this industry is not making much sense but they have a diversified portfolio and they say I want to affect the world I want to have something to do this is just one of many funds and the people who are engaging with filmmakers are doing so now in a way that was different than investors in the past. Pre-2008, one way we would invest and get somebody to invest in a film is we had these hedge fund things. And a hedge fund, I guess, was a concept of, you know, you would hedge your loss and you'd have a diversified portfolio that'd be, you know, a, a, a good investment on the right side, which would be, you know, IBM or oil, or, or General Electric. And then there'd be high risk on the far left, really high risk. But it was justified as the potential for really also high profit. And the high risk on the left side, in portfolios, they would put film. They would put entertainment. And film was in this category of high risk. And there were hedge funds in New York where there would be a guy who would be sitting at a desk just looking to put films to take money for films because it was high risk. So you would get investors pre-2008 who wouldn't even read the script. They wouldn't read the script. They would say, okay, it stars, um, it stars uh, uh, you know, somebody who has made money before and the genre is comedy and it stars Christian Wig, and she's done this much, and they do a little graph that says comedies are this, Christian Wig's done this, and the metrics make sense, and I'll invest it, why do I have to read it? Those were the old investors that were trying to invest be belief, believing that there was some real significant reason for financial reasons to invest in the film. Those days are over. So, People who are investing now in film are reading the scripts. They're picking scripts based on their passion, their desire to engage in the world, their own ideas. 
So as producers, as directors, I think I'd say all this negative stuff. It's all, I am an opinionated person, but it's also facts. They, anybody, if you just dig down, you'll find, you just look at the list of Sundance films and how much they sold for. Independent Filmmaker Magazine publishes it every year. So you don't have to take my word for it. But you can go to an investor and assume they're stupid and say, Blair Witch Project was made for $50,000 or Paranormal Activity was made for $50,000 and it made $50 million in the box office. You could say that and maybe somebody would think that that's a reason to invest in your film, but if you know anything about statistics and how they're used, you have to look at the context. You have to also look at a little deeper than just that number. And the reality is, is that the people who made Blair Witch Project and the people who made Paranormal Activity, those people made no money. Those investors who put the initial $100,000 made no money. They made their money back, but they did not participate in the $50 million. And that's the nature of the distribution system was able to keep them out of that. But most importantly, that's the needle in the haystack, and there's more films made than ever before. Um, there's everybody's able to make a film for $100,000. There's more content than ever before. So the odds are completely ludicrous that you would ever go to an investor and use it, uh, an old model and say, oh, I'm gonna be like that. It's just a ludicrous. There are some people that do that, and they still do that. That was the old way. You see people's finance plans, and they put those comparables in there. That's not how I engage. I don't want to be participating, collaborating with an investor who's a collaborator based on that kind of false data. I've been doing it for too long. It's dishonest. It's not right. And so I say to an investor, the first thing off is that if you're looking for me to make money for you, you're looking at the wrong person. My job is not to make money for you. My job is to spend your money well so we can make a film that is going to engage culture in the way that we are designing it to around the theme that we both agree on. And we're going to do the best we can to monetize that. We're going to do everything we can. Distribution is going to be investigated on every possible angle. We're going to do social media. We're going to do everything possible. I don't want to start this relationship with you thinking that you're going to be making this film because you think it's a good investment, because it's not. It's, it's not a place to put your money, to make money. It's possible to make money. Films do, some of them do return. Land Ho, for those women of Game Changer, was their first film. They returned their investment. It was a successful film. But we have to define success based on something other than money, if you're gonna be in this space. We have to create the criteria for success has to be about creating a dialogue with our target audience. Social media is great for that now. And that has to be part of how you're gonna engage with the investor. You can't go to an investor and start to talk to them that this is a way to make money. Because if they do more than five minutes of investigation, they'll know that you're in a crazy business that makes no sense on a financial level. So, that may sound a little depressing, but actually it's not, because again, we have more people than ever investing in the space. So how can the daughter of Megan Ellison, of uh, Larry Ellison, one of the richest people in the world, gave his daughter, I think, a billion dollars on her 21st birthday, let her throw the money away? She's not throwing the money away. First of all, she has a set of her own metrics that can understand what are the odds. She reduces the odds as much as possible. But she's somebody who's intelligent and wants to put the money to work and wants to engage in the world. So you as a filmmaker don't go to somebody and start talking to them about money return. I'm not gonna sit down with Megan Allison and talk to her about how I'm going to make her money. She doesn't need me to make her money. She needs me to make sure that the f money that she's giving us is being used to the best purpose and is worthy of the number. And that's where you engage with an investor. Is it really worth half a million? Is it really worth a quarter million? Is it worth 50,000? And this is how we engage, and this is where the mystery of the relationship is, how do we know what the film is worth? And this is really the nature of investment. 
And when you're engaging in a potential investor, you're not asking them for money. You can't, you're not saying, give me money so I can make my film. You're saying, do you share the passion in this theme that I have? Do you share the concern that I have that the bandwidth in America, cultural bandwidth in America since the internet's become prevalent, has reduced to a very, very small line? Do you realize that most people are spending their time playing war games and watching dogs fall down the stairs? Are you concerned with that? Are you concerned, let's say, on a specific level with issues of abortion or non-abortion? And are you concerned with this idea that there's very few female perspectives or African-American or Hispanic perspectives on a basic aspect of American culture that's represented in the media? <coughs> and this is, this, is, this is how we engage with investors. And this is why there's more money in our business than ever before. So it's a strange situation and a lot of times, younger people, when they're starting out, they want to believe that in this film business, there's got to be some secret that they don't know. There's got to be some secret of how people are making money and what's driving it. And you know, it, there is no secret. Hollywood's barely in the movie making business. The reality is Universal Studios is one fraction of another company's portfolio. They're basically getting out of the film business. They're in more of the merchandising business. They make very few films. They put all their money into Batman or Superman 2. And this is really where they are. This is the space they're in. They're the studios. They're barely making films. They understand that the metrics are ridiculous. In some ways, that's a good thing for us. It allows us more room to be able to make films that are different than Hollywood. But most importantly, the reality is it's being funded by people who have other motives besides making money. And this is the most important thing that you have to understand because your own choice of material has to be based around the fact that an investor who's presently engaged in this industry is doing it for reasons that are directly connected to a theme or a passion or an idea. So, if you take anything away from here, it's just, you know, you, you can't go into this business thinking that it's a way to make money, and it's not. And nobody actually really lives off this business. Um, Ridley Scott and Spike Jones don't live off their films. They make TV commercials. They make things for the um, corporate sports uh, complex, the, the uh, the halftime thing, you know, these filmmakers make these halftime videos and commercials for Nike, and then they make their movies. They're not living off. The biggest filmmakers, very few of them actually live off their films. They live off commercials. Likewise, we have to live off something other than just making films. Um, and everybody is that way because there's really no consistent revenue stream to support people to do this because there's no demand real, in reality for the 90 minute format. There's very little <coughs> demand for it and there's almost no way to monetize it. So any way you look at it financially, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a kind of an absurd space. So I say start off the relationship with a potential investor in that way, which is if there's money to be made, and there are for some films, Sure, Ira Sachs' new film is going to return the investment. Land Ho return the investment. If there's a way to do it, we're going to do it. But don't let's start this relationship just on the fact that you think you can get rich. Yes, can you, although this is a uh, special case, can you talk about the film Memphis and why that gives you hope? I don't know if anybody got to see the film Memphis. Um, I also want to say, I always try to plug this. Um, I sit, I teach at a program. We have a college in Venice, connected to the Venice Biennale. The Venice Biennale is a cultural festival that celebrates painting, sculpture, music. And film is one component. They have a film festival. Uh, every September 1. 
And we have a college connected to there. They have several different, they have an architecture college and a, and a film and music, and a music college. We have a film college. And it's uh, 15 projects are selected every year. And we bring 15 director producers, 15 projects and a director and producer to Venice. And uh, we put them through a four week kind of intensive program. I'm one of the producer teachers. And at the end, we select three of the 15 and give them $200,000 each to make a film. It's micro budget. And we guide them, we bring them back in January, we go over the budgets and we prepare those three projects. And then we will guide them through the year in making the film, three films, and then they premiere in the Venice Film Festival, those three films. The first year was a film called Memphis, that Tim Sutton did. And uh, the Venice Biennale is um, a cultural festival that's dedicated to trying to push the formal boundaries of each medium. Um, they are trying to expand the, 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 the form of each of their art. So with film, uh, the head of the festival wanted to see to what degree narrative strategies can spread in a different direction. How can we tell stories in a different way within the 90 minute format? And I'm not talking about uh, interactive uh, mumbo jumbo or pushing buttons or whatever that is. I'm talking about fixed, <coughs> fixed seat experience, 90 minute feature format. And so we pick films that are trying to tell stories in a different way. And then we award them the money and put them out there because the market driven system doesn't really allow for a lot of experimentation. And so Gucci is the sponsor. They give us the money every year. And we created this film, Tim Sutton made this film, Memphis, basically almost non-narrative, trying to tell a story that's lyrical, that engages the audience not through plot, but in a visual way. And it got picked up by IFP, uh, IFC, got a distributor, played other festivals, and it played in New York City and LA. In New York City, it played for over three weeks, yet it was, has no real stars, has no real characters in the sense of uh, plot. It has just a setting, beautiful photography, and themes and tensions that are spread out. And the film has done quite well. Um, it's, you know, it's made money, and it stayed in the theaters longer than most comedies, or you know, um, indie, a lot there's a lot of indie films that I call "Oops, I Farted," <laughs> and it stayed be in the theater longer than a lot of them. So I think that that says to me that if people are going to go to a movie theater, they want an experience that's unique to the film medium, and that's the other thing that I have to say, and I say to investors as well as to filmmakers. Why do we make a film? Why are we making a film and not a TV sitcom or a web series? You have to be able to give that answer to your investor. Because the investor will say, well, it seems that the platform of the web series or the TV show or the cable TV show is really potentially more profitable than the feature film format. And that's true. Probably the best way, if, best place for an investor to put their money now would be in the web series. We have this uh, series that was started about got people selling marijuana in New York called High uh, Maintenance or something. <coughs> and they did it themselves. And then it got picked up by Comedy Central and bought out. And so you would put your money into that. Everybody's making web series as a comedy thing. And an investor should, an educated investor should ask that. Why the 90 minute feature film theatrical format? Why? And the answer has to be from a filmmaker has to be that I am engaging the audience in a way that only the 90 minute theatrical format can do that. That has to do with pacing. It has to do with the relationship of close ups to wide shots. It has to do with the way story is told. If you're just doing a TV sitcom and it's a bunch of faces going like this, back and forth, ya, 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 you should be on TV. And so we see films like Memphis, which could never exist on TV. We really need to see it on the screen and it's a different headspace, doing well because people want to engage with the medium on a unique way. This is worthy of 90 minutes because I don't want to see it in two half hour segments as a comedy on TV. And so the 
Scarlett Johansson film, Under Her Skin. It's a real movie, Her, with, um, uh, by Spike Jones. It's a real film. These are things that have to be experienced. These are the films that are still doing well, relatively, because they are cinematic experiences. So for me, my view of this financial disaster actually, for me, supports my bias, which is I'm in the space because I want to engage the world seriously on a cultural level, and I want to see the medium, the basic plastic aspects of the, of, the, of the medium be explored in a way that's beyond just dialogue, beyond comedy, to the place where it's experienced in a visual way. So it's all a benefit to me. I'm having to make films for lower budgets than ever, but I'm making more of them. And I have a, a, an investor class that's truly collaborative. And I don't feel dishonest. Um, I don't feel like I have to trick them into giving me money. I'm able to engage with people who are financing it on an honest way. And we're all in a fight together, which is to try to widen the bandwidth, the cultural bandwidth in America, a bandwidth which is getting narrow and narrow and is being squeezed by sports and it's being squeezed by war games. And so this is the journey that you have to find. You have to find an investor who wants to take that journey with you. Okay, I yeah. got a question. <clears throat> How do you find uh, investors? And then second, did you see, I can't think of the actor name, he did uh, Kingdom Come? Kingdom Come? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and the road that he took, how he was going trying to find investors. Uh, to get his uh, movie, uh, he finally got that. So, do you think the way he did it was a good analysis that he did? For me, no. It's not. There's two. There's a basic. The most basic way of how you find investors is find out who's invested in the films you like. So, IMDb Pro is the most essential tool. You see a film, you drill down. Who are the producers? Go on their website. See who they are. You do that on Sundance, all the films, get the list, put in the IMDb Pro. You're going to see some names keep coming back. You're going to see websites. You're going to see a website for somebody, and you go on their website, and it says, we are investing in cultural films, films that are trying to move the bandwidth, that are trying to move the dial. We want to engage with intelligent Americans. Then you go on the website, and you see a whole bunch of names. You can't just cold call them. But I gen start, recommend to start at the bottom and write an inquiry letter and say, this is my script, would you read it? I know I don't have any experience or blah, 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 or I don't have a star attached. And those kinds of inquiry letters are worthwhile and they start to get you in the door. The bottom line is, is that it's very difficult to justify making a film that doesn't have a star in it. And the reality is, is that stars especially TV stars now, are very eager to be in the feature film format because they win awards. It's really, and they work for scale, they work for SAG scale. So just like I say that we have to engage investors on an intellectual level, we have to engage actors and their agents on an intellectual level. You need to work on my film for SAG scale, which is Screen Actors Guild, it's usually around 9.89 or according to your budget a week, because I believe that this will be able to demonstrate your skill set better than the TV show you're on every Friday, Two Broke Girls or Oops I Farted. You're going to be in my film and you're going to be a real human, not on your TV show. And it's going to show what I believe is your true potential. And I have a short film to show that I have gotten performances out of actors. So I know how to direct actors. And I believe your skills are not being well represented with your TV show, so. Another question, um, <coughs> is it good to, uh, when you deal with the promotional trailer uh, called the What's the Script, is, it a, is that a good idea to, when you're seeking investors? I think maybe to the degree that it would help characterize the style of the film. But a lot of times we don't have the money to do the trailer properly and so it's actually a little cheaper than you would when you make the film, you get bigger professionals. 
So sometimes trailers don't represent the film idea well because it's not done well. So I generally, you know, it's not, I don't think that it's something that really helps. I mean, um, it also depends on the type of movie, you know. If you're doing a special effects movie or if you're doing a shoot 'em up or if you're doing a zombie film, you do want to have some aspect of a trailer to show that you know how to do special effects correctly or that you know how to uh, rip somebody's head off and that you can see it, you know. And so action-based films still use them as a, as a proof of concept to some degree. But in drama, it's not worth it because you've got to engage with actors. Can you put in a little plug for Ted's talk you know, and people know about your friends talking through Yeah, so um, at, at uh, 3 p.m. Ted Hope speaks. Um, Ted uh, started in the beginning of the indie uh, of boom. Uh, the modern indie boom, I always want to say, uh, and I often start off all my talks saying that the first independent filmmaker in America was African American. The first f independent filmmaker, <coughs> his name was Oscar Michaud. Oscar Michaud was uh, a photographer based in Flatbush, Brooklyn. He would take Afri uh, photos of primarily African American subjects, and he saw the industry's greatest film at that time, which represented a very particular point of view. Birth of a Nation uh, was a film that D.W. Griffith, the Spielberg of the day, made in which uh, white people were able to save the South from the ravages of uh, African-American carpetbaggers. And um, an absurd film, which was celebrated as one of the greatest films in America. And he saw that, and like Spike Lee, was outraged. And went to make films that were just about the African-American experience. And the way he did that was he would write the scripts. There was an African-American race circuit of films, theaters, all across America. He'd go to those theater owners, show them stills and pictures, a trailer, so to speak, tell them the story. And each theater he would go to, he would change the story and change his pitch. And the pitch would get better, and he would ask them to pre-buy. They would give him money. He'd go back to Brooklyn with all the theaters that had gave him money, and he made the film, then brought it back and showed it and raised the money for the next one. He did pre-sales. He was the first <coughs> independent filmmaker. It's important to note that his passion was driven by rage. It was driven by anger to the establishment. So for me, independent film is anti-establishment. It's not, I want to be Spielberg, so I'm going to be indie now. That's not, for me, what independence is about. It's about representing an alternative viewpoint, an alternative viewpoint either through the lens of race or gender or class. That, to me, is the definition of independent filmmaker. Our, great, our first filmmaker here in America was driven primarily by the anger in which the establishment was misrepresenting the reality of the South through this film called Birth of a Nation. So I just wanted to say that. So Ted Hope started the more newer independent world. Oscar Michaud was back in those days. But in the late, early 90s, Ted Hope and James Seamus had a film, Good Machine, in which it started. They were at the beginning of the indie boom. And then they lasted all the way through the crash. And they're reconfigured now. And Ted is a runs Fandor. James Seamus got fired from his job at, at Focus, and that whole era is over. And Ted is somebody now who's lived through that one period and is now has a very specific view of the future. And he has a book in which he talks about what will be the future in a way similar to mine. And so he's worth seeing it through. We have time for one more okay. question, Mike. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've been. <coughs> Excuse me, the industry has been living with crowdfunding for a few years now, uh, where you know it was a big thing a, a while back. Uh, what do you see as uh, has has that changed uh, things? Uh, has it lived up to its promise, or is it? Uh, uh, where are we at with the crowdfunding situation? Yeah, I'm not a big crowdfunding fan. I'm not really. Uh, 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 I think what it's good for is building your audience base, spreading the word. It's the first step of finding your audience. 
The reality is films are not financed by people, by a bunch of people sending in $50 or $5 or $10. The crowdfunding is a good way for your dentist to not look you in the eye and give you a check for $5,000. And it's a way for people to invest in a way that's different than what used to be, which is the embarrassing ask. Uh, and it's usually bigger numbers in the funding sources. And for me, it's a way to start the energy, but it's not a place to really, I think, fully finance the film, although some films have done it, and certainly bigger people who are well known get to do it. But I just said, I didn't put it as part of the finance plan when I defined the terms at the beginning of this talk, um, which is, I probably should, because it's a very small percentage of your finance plan. I, I don't really see it as being, uh, unless you could make, you're gonna make the film for $25,000, then maybe it's possible. But uh, for starting off and for a lot of people that don't have established names, I don't really see it as a significant way to raise money. I see it as a significant way to start your crowd sourcing, your social media, you're trying to find your audience campaign, and that's what it's good for. Um, uh, but it also has to do with content, and my content is drama, and it's not necessarily well suited to that format, I think. That's great, Grant, your question. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, do you think investors are interested in um, sorts that could potentially lead to fe uh, features to invest in those? Say that again. To invest in shorts that could uh, potentially lead to features. That's the other thing that's important, is that investors often want to invest in you. They believe in you. They want to engage in you as a person. They want to believe, they want to empower you because they believe your vision of the world should get out there. A lot of time investors invest because they say, I want to be in business with you. I like your viewpoint. I know your personal history. I know what you want to do. How are we going to get your voice in? And I want to, as an investor, to empower you, to make you the next um, uh, um, Spike Jones. And part of that journey may be making a short. An investor may say, I believe in you. I don't think you're ready right now with this script. Let's make a short and get you started. And as a goal towards getting the feature, not just one feature, but how is the next feature gonna build to this place where, I'm go where we're going together to create you to be an auteur like Spike Jones. So I do work with an investor in Connecticut who are interested in a particular director's growth and they financed three of his horror films and they hit the wall and they came to me and they said, the investor came to me and said, how can you help me make this director better because I believe he could be better. And we came up with a plan. And um, investors a lot of times want to invest in people and visionaries and shorts are a part to build that. You have to be able to acknowledge to yourself and to your partner I may not be ready for the feature, let's make it short. And let's do that together. And let's think about this as a long term. An investor has to be honest to say, I am not made of money. You know, I have this much money to play with. This is this much I want to use. Let's figure out a strategy together. And a short might be a way to start that. And maybe investors, some investors want to say, let's use the money to find more money. Let's figure out how to empower my money because I'm not Megan Ellison here. But what is the best way for my little money with you and your passion that we can build this so we can find bigger investors? How can, as an investor, can I, with my limited resources, get it to the place where we can bring it to Megan Ellison in five years or seven years? And so that collaboration, again, as the investor is co-creator is important and one of that strategies may involve a short film. Thank you very much, Mike, for your role. Uh, <laughs> Our next panel is at 145, and it is Black Indie Filmmaking.